What's up guys? Welcome back. Mom and Dr. Jones, OBGYN and mom to four. This video was made in 1946. That is, math is hard. 74 years ago now, the story of menstruation as told by Disney and as reviewed by yours truly, real live in the flesh, OBGYN YouTuber. Thank you for having me. So excited to be here today. I don't really think I deserve to be creator of the year, but I'm so thrilled. Focus. <laughs> what was that? We like the little things around here. Anyway, 1946 Disney, the story of menstruation. Let's go. Why, right from the beginning, we breathe and sleep and wake up with no more conscious planning than we used in sprouting teeth. Mother Nature controls many of our routine bodily processes through automatic control centers called glands. The story of menstruation really begins- That transition from the creepy animated baby to whatever that doll is was terrifying. And if I was a 10 year old girl watching this, I would be panicked. I don't like horror movies. What are they showing me? My mom said I'm not even allowed to watch horror movies. It begins with one particular gland. It's located here at the base of the brain and it's called a pituitary gland. In our childhood years, this pituitary gland concentrates on producing growth hormones. Busy little messengers which circulate through the bloodstream. They order the various bones and tissues to get growing. That was mostly right. They did leave out the hypothalamus. So what they're describing right now is the HPO, hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis. And the first hormone that starts this kind of cascade is GnRH, which is gonadotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus. That signals the pituitary to release the hormones that they're discussing now. Then the pituitary starts making hormones called LH, which is luteinizing hormone, and FSH, which is follicle stimulating hormone. And those go down, and I'm sure they'll get into this, and act on the ovaries. Of course, these orders vary among different girls. Some girls grow short, some tall, some heavy, and some slight. I like that they address that everybody's a little bit different. Some people start their period earlier, some people start their period later, some people grow tall, some people have height problems. But there comes a time somewhere between the ages of 11 and 17, though about 13 is average, when the pituitary must turn part of its attention to maturing the body which it has grown. The average age of menarche is around 12 and a half in the United States right now. Menarche is the onset of periods, but puberty starts earlier than that with a sudden growth spurt and with secondary sex characteristics, hair growth under the arms, pubic hair, and breast development happening prior to the onset of menses, which we call menarche. So it starts sending out a new type of hormone, a maturing hormone, and that is when menstruation begins, when these maturing hormones start coming down through the bloodstream to the ovaries. I feel like that's a decent way to describe what the pituitary is doing. For the purposes of discussing this with a, I don't know, seven to 10 year old, this is accurate so far. The ovaries themselves are glands about the size of almonds and locked within each ovary are thousands of eggs. Near the ovaries are the fallopian tubes, short canals which lead to the uterus or womb. This hollow pear-shaped organ opens into the vagina, which is part of the birth canal, and is the external opening for this whole group of organs. There needs to be a discussion here of three holes. One is where urine comes out, one is where babies are made and where periods come out, and one is where your bowel movements come out. This lets the kids start to get an idea of what is going on down there so that when they actually have a period, it's not terrifying. Now one of the ovaries passes on an order of its own. It tells the cells which make up the lining of the uterus to multiply and fill themselves with watery fluids and blood. This begins to build up a thickened lining of somewhat velvety material. That's an accurate depiction also. Estrogen acts on the inside of the uterus, the endometrial lining, and that causes increase in size and number of the endometrial cells. This is called the 
proliferative phase of the endometrial cycle. Both the ovaries and the uterus have cycles, which are cut into two separate groups. The uterus has a proliferative phase and a secretory phase, which just describes what the inside of the uterus is doing. And the ovaries have a follicular phase, which goes on at the same time as the proliferative phase inside the uterus. And the ovaries also have a luteal phase, which goes on at the same time as the secretory phase on the inside of the uterus. And it's all just based on like what's happening in that part of the system at that time. At the same time, an ovary has been maturing an ovum or egg, which is magnified here so that we can see it. About once a month, one of these tiny eggs passes out of the ovary and finds its way into a fallopian tube where it moves along toward the uterus. If the egg is impregnated, which happens when a woman is going to have a child, the egg will stay within the uterus. Then the thickened lining will provide nourishment for the budding human being. Most eggs pass through the fallopian tubes without being fertilized. I feel like this was a little bit of a missed opportunity and I know it was the 1940s and things were totally different, but at this point in the discussion, age appropriate discussion of how pregnancy happens is required. This is why we had and continue to have misinformation about how babies are made among young adolescents and everybody actually. It's not just like, oh my gosh, there's a pregnancy. There's a little more that goes into it. Why is it important that the kids know this young? Because they're not overthinking it. My kids ask questions all the time because of what I do. You don't have to be graphically detailed, but giving them the information they need to continue to place those building blocks allows them to have the maturity to make good decisions as they get older and are put in situations where you aren't there to be in their ear telling them things. Definitely the age where I would start talking to kids about how babies are made. You at least need to tell them it requires a sperm and an egg. This is how the egg gets there. Sperm gets there through sex. If they have more questions than that, just answer them honestly. I get that question a lot. How do I talk to my kids about sex? I truly feel like this shouldn't be like a sudden discussion. Like there's never a time where you just sit your kid down and have birds and bees discussion. You encourage them to ask questions when they have them and you answer them in an age appropriate way that's honest. You definitely shouldn't leave it completely out, like it just happens and a baby is made. When this happens, there's no use for that potential nourishment in the built up lining of the uterus. And so in a few days, it passes from the body. Menstruation is just one routine step in a normal and natural cycle that is going on continuously within the body. Time between periods is usually about 28 days. However, it may be shorter for some girls, longer for others. From a hormonal standpoint, what's happening is that the ovulation site kind of creates a little cyst on the ovary, which is totally normal and should be there after ovulation. It creates progesterone. Progesterone acts on the uterus to kind of stabilize things. And then that goes away because it usually dies in 14 days. The progesterone levels drop dramatically all of a sudden, and that's what induces shedding of the endometrial lining. Menstruation may differ widely among normal women. The important thing is that you should be fairly regular within yourself. Periods should always be about the same number of days apart and last about the same length of time. The average length of menstruation, five to seven days, and then they said 28 days apart for periods. 28 to 35 days is a normal cycle length. That is importantly from cycle day one, which is the first day of your period, to the last day of your cycle, which is the day before your next period. So from the first day of bleeding to the first day of bleeding should be about 28 to 35 days. And this is what we as gynecologists call a cycle. In a physiologic sense, the cycle is this entire system of hormones acting together. Try not to throw yourself off schedule by getting overtired, emotionally upset, or catching cold. And if your timing goes seriously wrong, or you're bothered with severe cramps or headaches, you should have a talk with your doctor. <laughs> wow! Try not to get overly upset or emotional. Try not to catch a cold. Nobody tries to catch a cold and make their period get thrown off, although being sick or stressed can certainly affect that. How many 
of those girls then went on to have menstrual problems and internalize that as, oh my gosh, I'm causing this to happen because I'm too stressed or I got sick or whatever. I don't really think that was helpful. Why the unnecessary blame, Disney? Of course you'll want to keep a personal calendar. Mark the first day of each period and check to see that there are about the same number of days between periods. It's not only a useful record of past performance, but it comes in handy when you have to plan ahead. I love that they're telling them to keep a calendar. I think that was probably a little bit progressive of Disney at the time because I don't think, one, this was much talked about at all, but also I don't think that people were really encouraged to keep track of their cycles quite as much as we are now. I like this because it is not uncommon for someone to come to my office and say, my period isn't regular. I don't start on the third of each month. Months are not going to coincide very well with your period because the length of your cycle can be 28 to 35 days and calendar months change how long they are each month. So it's not gonna come on the same day. Or someone will say, I didn't have a period in February. Finish their three day cycle on the last day of January and then they started again on the first day of March. Well, that's not technically missing your period if your periods were already that length. You have to be keeping track of that, not just like remembering, oh, I had a period in January, I had a period in February, as if we don't have enough things to worry about, right? But don't get too upset and try not to catch cold or you'll cause your periods to be crazy and you'll have to go to the gynecologist. It would be a shame. Among other things, the booklet explodes that old taboo against bathing during your period. Not only can you bathe, you should bathe. Because during menstruation, your perspiration glands are working overtime. Just be careful to avoid either very hot water or very cold water. In fact, it's not a good idea at any time to shock your system with extremes, any more than to let yourself get chilled or to catch cold. I don't know where the like not too hot, not too cold thing comes in. I mean, there's nothing about that that's super important. The other interesting thing that they mentioned was your sweat glands are working overtime. There's some truth to that. In the last half of the cycle after ovulation, when progesterone levels are high, that does increase your set body temperature just slightly. It's very minimal, but sometimes people do feel warmer in the last two weeks before their period comes and that's because of progesterone. I would say most people aren't having like excessive sweating as a result of that. It's a very small temperature increase but it is enough that sometimes you feel that and when you're tracking your basal body temperature you have to even have a very special thermometer because it's a minor increase but it is a, a sustained increase in body temp. And as for the old taboo against exercise, that's nonsense. Exercise is good for you during menstruation. Just use common sense. When you come to think of it, most of your daily routine is on the mild side. It's going to extremes that's wrong and to be avoided. Okay, yeah, like don't hurt yourself, but I don't think there's any reason during your period that there's certain extremes that would be more or less harmful. As far as modern day advice is concerned, you don't have to adjust your activity level at all just because you're on your period. Exercising consistently is helpful for cramps and all the symptoms that people associate with PMS like bloating and mood changes and things like that. To most girls, the menstrual period should bring no severe discomfort. Some girls have a little less pep, a feeling of pressure in the lower part of the body, perhaps an occasional twinge or a touch of nerves, but don't let it get you down. After all, no matter how you feel, you have to live with people. You have to live with yourself too. And once you stop feeling sorry for yourself and take those days in your stride, you'll find it's easier to keep smiling and even tempered. Okay, that took an interesting turn. Don't dramatize yourself. <laughs> I think even then it was clearly recognized that there was a hormonal change that was contributing to your mood changes that can happen immediately leading up to or during your period. But again, they continue to blame that on you. And once you stop feeling sorry for yourself and take those days in your stride. How, it's, this blows my mind. Like I understand that the social time was different, but they just describe all these vast hormonal changes, including brain changes, 
with hormones in the brain and then they basically say like buck up buttercup it's your fault that you feel that way and you still have to live with people what a horrible message to give to really young girls i am very thankful we live in a time where we can improve that if people are having symptoms that are interfering with their life you can do practically everything you normally do oh come now we said practically everything provided you take common sense care of yourself apparently there is some kind of dancing that's not okay when you're on your period too there's this juxtaposition of giving good information and almost giving enough information but then like reverting back to the time which obviously makes sense they were creating this within the social constructs of the 40s and 50s just really interesting where they decided to draw the line and do something about that slouch slumpy posture is just as bad inside as it looks outside reproductive organs lie between the rectum and the bladder and their external openings and constipation will disturb the relationship between these organs drink plenty of water eat plenty of fruit and to include cereals and eggs and leafy vegetables in your daily diet. It's smart to keep looking smart. That well-groomed feeling will give you new poise and lift your morale. Okay, again, this juxtaposition. They threw in some great information that I didn't expect them to, which is constipation can affect your reproductive organs and your bladder because of the location of those things. They also give good accurate information about how to avoid constipation, having a good varied healthy diet, drinking lots of fluids, eating fiber in the form of leafy green vegetables and fruits. I don't know where the uh, eggs come in but apparently that's good for constipation. I don't think that's true. And then they go on to say also you need to look good to feel good because that's your job is to look good. And that's the story. There's nothing strange nor mysterious about menstruation. All life is built on cycles, and the menstrual cycle is one normal and natural part of nature's eternal plan for passing on the gift of life. You know, they left off with like just general healthy, positive choices information, and then they like nailed it home on you need to get married and have babies. I wish they would have just cut it off before that. Overall, I think this was good information, clearly presented under the umbrella of culture in the 1940s and 50s. Still, I would say relatively progressive for the time with what they discussed. I'm happy with it overall. It was still really boring and I will again say I could do better. Someone hire me to make a all about your menstrual period video. Maybe I could just do a tour. I've been wondering what my YouTuber tour was going to be and now I have it. My YouTuber tour is going to be talking to you about your periods, talking to your kids about their periods, sex ed for all. Just kidding. I'm not going on tour. I'm not going on tour. Talking too much, too much coffee and caffeine today. Great. If you haven't watched this video, is that the right way? I never know which way to point. If you haven't watched the other video on the screen right now, click on it. If you're new here, please subscribe. I'm clearly a very normal and even keel person. I will see you back on Monday next week. Be kind to yourself, to each other, to me. In the comments, be kind. And I will see you next time.